and they never make it. You know, they never catch that perfect wave. They never get that big break. Maybe after 28 rejections, they don't send it to the 29th publishing house. You know, the person who could have given them their chance left the coffee house just five minutes before they walked in, and they never met him or her. And so they live and they die in obscurity, never achieving their dreams. I'm sure it happens, and I'm pretty sure it happens way more often than these success stories that we celebrate. So today I want to take a look at one of those people who never quite made it. Her life is described in Genesis, and like I say, she is Jacob's first wife, Leah. And the story of Leah, it's really heartrending. You just feel for her. You read about her in Genesis, and like I say, your, your, your heart goes out to her. She was the older daughter of Laban. She was the sister of Rachel. And she lived in the shadow of Rachel all her life. Now, Rachel was the beauty of the family. We talked about this a little bit last week. You know, she was the one on whom the stars shone. She attracted all the attention. In today's society, she would have been the, the head cheerleader. She would have been the prom queen. She would have been the valedictorian of her high school. She would have got a full rise at college. She was the one that had Leah, who lacked her physical attributes, and Genesis described her as having weak eyes. We don't know what that means. It could mean that she was almost blind. It could mean she was cross-eyed. There was something about it that, you know, uh, she just lacked Rachel's attractiveness. And I think she would have just faded into the background. You know, her prospects for marriage, her marriage were probably pretty minimal. You know, with Rachel, I can, I can just envision Laban sleeping in, the lawn, in a lawn chair in the front yard with a shotgun across his, his lap. Leah, eh, not so much. Nothing to worry about there, Dad. But finally, she had an opportunity to be married. And not because something anybody actually wanted her, quite the opposite. It was through a deceptive little plan hatched by her father, where on the wedding night, he swapped why when um, it was supposed to be Rachel's wedding night, he swapped daughters and gave Leah to Jacob instead of Rachel. She went through with the plan that her father came up with, probably, well, partly because the father was the law in those days and what the father said goes. But also, you know, she might have been thinking, this might be my one and only chance to get married. He doesn't necessarily want me, but, you know, we can pull this off. I can get a husband. And so, you know, quite predictably, her married life started badly. On the morning after the wedding, when her husband rolled over and realized that he married the wrong lady, uh, realized that he'd been deceived, he reacted pretty much as you, one would anticipate him reacting. He was shocked. He was angry. He was upset. He confronted Laban. And he was like, I don't want you. I want to Rachel! You can almost hear Leah thinking, oh man, here we go again. Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. <laughs> you know, it becomes obvious as we read her story that Leah's dreams for her life were yeah, they're pretty simple. You know, she didn't want to be a J.K. Rowling. She didn't want to be an Albert Einstein. She didn't want to be a Dr. Seuss. She really just wanted a happy, loving family. And that was it. That's all we see in the, in the text. She wanted children. And she wanted the love of her husband. I get that. You know, I think most of us get that. You have a happy and loving family in this day and age? Yeah, you're doing fairly well. And yet as simple as that dream was, it was out of reach all of her life. She never achieved it. Family, yes, she got that. She got lots of kids. Loving husband? Not so much. Love was reserved, as usual, for Rachel. So let's read about her life after the wedding. Genesis 29, verses 31 through 35. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, It's because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again, and yet when she gave birth to a son, she said, Because the Lord heard that I'm not loved, he gave me this one too. And she named him Simeon. 
Again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me because I've born him three sons. So he was named Levi. And she conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah, and then she stopped having children. You know, because Jacob was tricked into marrying Leah as well as Rachel, you know, he seems to have never gotten over it. He seems to never have forgiven her for consenting to deceive him in that way. He always regards Rachel as his, as his wife and treats Leah and her children as something else, something inferior, something less. And this preference for Rachel's son, uh, that when she has a son finally, apparently continues for many years and it's going to come back and it's going to bite him later, as we'll see. But God in his grace and mercy saw the plight of Leah, married and unloved, and enabled her to have children. Of course, Jacob, especially in this paternalistic culture there, I actually said it, uh, would have wanted sons, lots of sons, the more sons, the, the better. We want sons. And so Leah obliged, hoping that with every consecutive son, finally, Jacob's heart would be turned to her. Finally, he would love her and her dream would be realized. So she gives birth to Jacob's firstborn son. She names him Reuben. And with all these names, there's some play on words going on. Reuben sounds like the Hebrew word for see, a son. Jacob, I've given you the desires of your heart, a son. Then she thinks, surely my, my husband will love me now. But no, Jacob's heart is moved. Then a second son. Whom she, whom she named Simeon, and the name is connected to the Hebrew word heard, as in the Lord heard that I not love. But again, no response from Jacob. He simply doesn't love her, and appears that that is not going to change. She has a third son, Levi, whose name sounds like the Hebrew for become attached to, and Leah exclaims, now at last my, my husband will become attached to me, because I've born him three sons. You know, now at last expresses her desire and her frustration, maybe at failing to win her husband's love. She's thinking that, you know, three sons, this is just too great a blessing that I've given him. But he never changes. And at the end of the passage, we're told that he has a fourth son, or she has a fourth son, Judah, whose name means he will be praised. And note that with this son, it appears that Leah has pretty much given up. She's realized she's not gonna achieve her dream. She's not going to be have a loving husband. And she's accepted her lot in life. And she expresses no hope that Jacob would respond in love. She simply praises God for the new baby. And the text says at this point she stopped having children. And it's hard to know if Jacob just lost interest in her altogether, or she's lost interest in him, but the baby stopped, at least for now. Sometimes later we'll, later we'll see that her dream hadn't actually died, but it was disappearing quickly. Reuben, later on in the story, Reuben, Leah's firstborn, found some mandrake plants. Now, I don't know what those are. I, I wouldn't know a mandrake plant if I fell over one. But apparently, in the day, these were thought to have aphrodisiac properties. And Rachel saw the plants that Reuben had gathered, and she wanted some. And Rachel offered Leah a night with Jacob in exchange for the plants. So when Jacob got back in the field, Leah basically told him, hey, I purchased a night with you from Rachel for some mandrake plants. And, you know, that's pretty sad in and of itself. Hi, husband. I went out and I bought a night with you. You know, how low do you go, know, right? Tragic that the relationship had degraded to this point. But once again, Leah becomes pregnant. She bears a fifth son, Issachar, then a sixth, Zebulun. And at the birth of Zebulun, Leah reveals that her dream had never died. She exclaims, God has presented me with a precious gift. This time my husband will treat me with honor because I've born him six sons. She's still hoping. She's still dreaming, but it was not to be. And at this point, she pretty much disappears from the narrative. She's mentioned a few times later on, but not as an actor, more of a prophet. She just kind of mentioned in passing. At some point in the story, she dies and is buried in the cave that Abraham bought as a burial place in Canaan. Jacob, in his last words to his son, simply mentions that he buried her there. And so the account of Leah ends. You know, it's obvious that throughout her life, she maintains her walk with God. She performed her duties as wife and mother, but 
but she never realized the dream of a loving husband. From her marriage until her death, she never knows the love of Jacob. To him, she was and always would be a cipher, a zero, almost a non-person. And so she carries her dream with her to the grave, unrealized. Yet that really isn't the end of the story. Let's go back to the passage in Genesis 29. Again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now, at last, my husband will become attached to me because I've born him three sons, so, she, so he was named Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave him birth to a son, this time I'll praise the Lord, so she named him Judah. Those, ring, those names ring a bell? Well, they should. Let's look at Levi. After the period of slavery in Egypt, after the ten plagues, and the freeing of God's people, while they're on their way back, Moses leading them back to the promised land. We read this in, in Numbers 3, 5-9. through 9. The Lord said to Moses, Bring the tribe of Levi and present him to Aaron, the priest, to assist him. There to perform duties for him and for the whole community of the tent of meeting by doing the work of the tabernacle. They are to take care of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting, fulfilling the obligations of the Israelites by doing the work of the tabernacle. Give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are the Israelites who are to be given wholly to him. The descendants of Le Leah's son Levi would serve God as priests from that time on through the entire history of the nation of Israel. They were the only men allowed by law to serve in the tabernacle. The only ones who pre would present the offerings of the people to God. The only ones who could enter the Holy of Holies. Holy of Holies into the very presence of God. The descendants of Leah's son Levi. But it gets even better. Let's look at the fourth son Judah. In Revelation 5.5, 5, Jesus is described this way. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He's able to open the scroll and its seven seals. The lion of the tribe of Judah is Jesus. Both of the genealogies of Jesus presented in the New Testament trace his lineage back to Judah. And this makes Leah, not Rachel, but Leah, the great, 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 whole bunch of greats, grandmother of Jesus, God's Son, the Savior of the world. You know the old girl did pretty well after all. <laughs> Put that on your resume. The great-grandmother of the entire priestly clan, the great-grandmother of the Holy the great-grandmother of the Son of God. So what do we do with this? How do we apply the story of Leah to our own lives? And I think there's a couple of points of application. <coughs> the first is, you know, when we get right down to it, our dreams, our plans, our desires mean a whole lot less to God than do his dreams and his plans and his desires. You know, I'm guessing back in our 20s, we all had dreams, we all had plans, we all had amazing things we wanted to do and things we wanted to see, I don't know. Maybe we had a bucket list at that age. Probably a loving family factored in there somewhere. Maybe a good job, fulfilling career, travel, see the world, see our kids launched well, financial security, good health, find the highest peaks on the seven continents, uh, jump out of a perfectly good airplane. I don't know. We probably all had a list of stuff we wanted to do. And I'm kind of guessing that at least some of those items haven't been fully, haven't been achieved fully. You know, back in the 20s, I it's still on my bucket list, but it was to hike the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine. And, uh, you know, those days when I stumble out of bed and barely make up the steps. I, I wonder if that horse has left the stall. So to speak. <laughs> but, uh, you know, God gave Leah part of her dream, lots of kids, but he never gave her the other part. Maybe the most important part. And you know, he could have. It would have been so easy for him. And Jacob just loves her. She would have just waited one day to a husband that loved her dearly, but it never happened. God never did it. And I wonder if it had to be that way in order to fulfill God's plan. You remember that I mentioned that the way Jacob treated Leah slopped over onto her kids? When Joseph came along, Rachel's firstborn, he treated her just like he treated Rachel. He was clearly the favorite. He bestowed all kinds of lavish gifts and things on him, the coat of many colors. 
He was demonstrably the golden child. And this set up a series of events leading to his slavery and to his rise in Egypt to be the second in command of the entire country and to the salvation of God's people. In a very real sense, God set aside Leah's dreams, I think, in order that he could fulfill his own. Leah was never loved. She was never favored. But that dynamic that existed in the family created the dynamic that sent Joseph to slavery and that saved the people of God. So when we're dealing with these twists and turns of life, it's a good thing to keep in mind. You know, God is at work in and through us, not so that we can achieve our goals and our dreams and our desires, but so that he can achieve his. And we may never see it in our lifetime. Leah never saw her grandkids serving in the temple. She never saw her grandson Jesus, at least till she got to heaven, but in her hardship and in her disappointment, God accomplished his purposes for her and through her and did some amazing things. And faith means that we trust in this fact, that God is working out his purposes in us, no matter what the circumstances might be, whether or not we take up all the items on our bucket list, or whether we leave them all unfilled, no matter what happens, God, because we are his children, is working out his purposes in our life. And the second aspect I think Leah teaches us is that faithfulness trumps success every single time. You know, God is, he's never called us to be another J.K. Rowling or Einstein or Dr. Seuss. We might be in our own way. Who knows? We might write the world's greatest novel at some point. Um, there isn't anything wrong with achieving great things in this life, but this really isn't the point. It isn't how God evaluates us. You know, he's only really looking for faithful obedience. That's all he's looking for. Whether we reject it 28 or 58 or 108 times in pursuit of our dreams, whether or not we achieve our dreams at all, God is looking for faithfulness, faithful obedience from us. That's the, that's the standard. And that's the main thing I see in this story, that at the moment when it became obvious to Leah that her dream would never be realized, she had presented Jacob with his fourth son, and his reaction was, meh. At that point, when her spirit had to have been crushed, when she realized that she would never have a love of her husband, she prays to God. What an amazing example. You know, God, like I say, He doesn't call us to be successful, He calls us to be faithful. And there's a big difference between the two. The author of Hebrews talks about faithfulness in chapter 11, verses 32 through 39. And He does it in the context of two groups of people the wildly success, successful and the, I put it in quotes, failures. Let's read through that real quickly. What more shall I say? I don't have the time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdom as administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of the lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. This was the wildly successful group. These are the ones he names. These were the people that accomplished great things in the power of God. But there's another group in this passage, 11, uh, 35 through 39. He continues, there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might even gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. There were others. And we don't even know for sure who he was talking about. But obviously these people were on the list of the top 10 wealthiest people on earth or whatever. By any measure of success, these people weren't on the list. They suffered greatly. But the point that the author of Hebrews makes is that they were all commended. The ones we know their names of and the others, they were all commended, not for their accomplishment, but for their faithfulness. It wasn't for what they did. It wasn't for what they suffered. It was in that moment of accomplishment. It was in that moment of ordeal that they're being focused on and committed to God. And that's what God wants of us. Whether we're in the first group or the second group, or somewhere in between, 
regardless of what we encounter, regardless of whether or not we realize our dreams, God wants us to remain trusting in Him for the final resolution. So that's the story of life. You know, if we're going to take anything away from this, I think it's this. It's not about us. It really isn't. Yes, God has promised to care for us. He's promised to bless us. He's promised to welcome us into His eternal kingdom one day. But it's always about Him. He deserves our praise, our love, our devotion, our faithfulness, because He has sacrificed everything to make that possible. He has earned it. And that should be enough for us. And along the way, He might just give us the desires of our hearts. He might just allow us to accomplish our dreams. But even if He doesn't, if we serve Him faithfully, we know that he's going to use us to accomplish his purposes and dreams. And those are going to be so much better than our own. You know, Leah had no idea about the Levites. She had no idea about the Son of God. But I think what a, how proud she was when she realized, hey, that's my family. I think we're going to be that, we're going to be like that one day. When we see what God's done through us in our complete obliviousness, we're going to be like, wow, cool, awesome. Look what he did. We can rest assured that no matter what, the dreams he has for us and the dreams that he is accomplishing in us are way better than anything that we can come up with on our own. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the story of Leah. The encouragement that it, that it gives us that, you know, in spite of just a life that uh, would have been so disappointing to her in so many ways, that Father, behind the curtains, Without her even knowing it, you were through her going to accomplish some incredible, some wonderful, some amazing things. And Lord, we, we just ask that you do the same thing in our lives. That, that, like I say, one day we're gonna, we would get to heaven and we'd look at what you have done in us and through us, and we would just be knocked off our feet. Wow, I had no idea, God. This is amazing. Just We, we look forward to, to that, Lord. That, uh, one day you reveal us to us your hopes and your dreams for us and for how you work those out in our lives. So help us to be faithful in all things, Lord. Help us never take our eyes off of you, but to trust in you that you are accomplishing your purposes in us. It's in Jesus' name we pray.